Welcome, friends. Let's stand together for the procession.
of the Fuli Bridge in Amis to be the chief consecrator of the consecration of the Venerable Daniel Christian Gilford as coadjutor bishop in Christ, one holy Catholic and apostolic church, to become the third ordinary of the Anglican network in Canada. Our Bishop Fuli is a primate of the Anglican Church in North America and the Diocesan Bishop of the Diocese of the South. Your Grace, on behalf of the Diocese of Anglican and the people of Holy Shepherd Church, Vancouver, we are so joyful to receive you in Christ, particularly in this time of the pandemic, your presence means a lot to us. We also welcome all bishops, clergy, and lay who have come together, both in person and online, to support the bishop coadjutor elect then in the unity in Christ and the one holy Catholic apostolic church. We particularly welcome our bishop Emeritus Bob Duncan, Bishop Julian Dobbs, Bishop Clark, Clark Novafield, Bishop Felix Orgy, who have traveled a long way here. And of course, we welcome all Canadian bishops of Anik, particularly our, di our diocesan, Bishop Charlie Masters. Now today, we give thanks to God all collected offering will be used for church planting mission in Anik. At the end of the service, you're welcome to go to the parish hall. We have a book table of our recently published book, The Anglican Network in Canada, Protax, Providence, and Promise in Global Anglican Realignment that tells the history and the road to the birth of our diocese. I encourage every clergy to bring at least one, maybe more than one, to your parish, parish church front to share our witness and testimony. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Stephen. Our service now continues with the opening acclamation. The Lord will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. You shall know that the Lord is in the midst of his people. And that he is the Lord and there is none else. And it shall come to pass. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Together let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. All desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Godly and well-learned man, to be ordained and consecrated bishop. I now ask that the testimonials from the chair of the Anglican Network in Canada nominating committee, Archbishop Paul, I mean it's Archdeacon Paul, <laughs> and uh, Bishop Julian of the College of Bishops, um, read the testimonials. Most Reverend Father in God, I certify that the Venerable Daniel Christian Gifford was duly nominated as Bishop of the Diocese of the Anglican Network in Canada by the clergy and lay members of Synod of the Diocese on November the 18th, 2021, as attested to by the minutes of the Synod. Most Reverend Father and God, I certify that the Venerable Daniel Christian Gifford was duly elected coadjutor bishop of the Anglican Network in Canada by the College of Bishops of the Anglican Church in North America on January 12, 2022, 
as attested to by the minutes of the college. Dan, the canons of this church require that no priest may be consecrated as a bishop in the church before subscribing without reservation to the oath of conformity. It is also required that he subscribe without reservation to the oath of canonical obedience. In addition, the Anglican Network in Canada requires all church clergy to subscribe to the Declaration of Assent. In the presence of this congregation, I now charge you to make your solemn declaration of these oaths. <clears throat> I, Daniel Christian Gifford, do believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and to contain all things necessary to salvation and I consequently hold myself bound to conform my life and ministry thereto. And therefore, I do solemnly engage to conform to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of Christ as this church has received them. And I do promise, here in the presence of Almighty God and of the church, that I will pay true and canonical obedience in all things lawful and honest to the Archbishop of the Anglican Church in North America and his successors, so help me God. And I declare my belief in the faith which is revealed in the Holy Scriptures and set forth in the Catholic creeds and to which the historic formulas given to us by the Church of England bear witness, the 39 Articles of Religion, the Book of Common Prayer, and the ordering of bishops, presbyters, and deacons. And in public prayer and administration of the sacraments, I will use only the forms of service which are authorized or allowed by canon. I invite you to sign the oath in the presence of all these witnesses. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it is written in the Gospel of St. Luke that our Savior Jesus Christ continued the whole night in prayer before He chose and sent forth His twelve apostles. It is written also in the Acts of the Apostles that the disciples at Antioch fasted and prayed before they sent forth Paul and Barnabas by laying their hands upon them. Let us therefore follow an example of our Savior and His apostles Offer up prayers to Almighty God before we admit and send forth this person presented to us to do the work to which we trust the Holy Spirit has called him. So I invite those who are able to please kneel. Have mercy on us. O God the Son, have mercy on us. O God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. O Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, and that it may please you to grant peace to the whole world and to your church. That it may please you to sanctify and bless your holy church throughout the world. That it may please you to inspire all bishops, priests, and deacons with the love of you and of your truth. That it may please you to endue all ministers of your church with devotion to your glory and to the salvation of souls. That it may please you to bless this our brother Daniel and to send your grace upon him that he may duly execute the office 
to which he is called, to the edification of your church, and to the honor, praise, and glory of your name. That it may please you to guide by your indwelling spirit those whom you call to the ministry of your church, that they may go forward with courage and persevere to the end. That it may please you to increase the number of ministers in your church, that the gospel may be preached to all people. That it may please you to grant us true repentance, amendment of life, and the forgiveness of all our sins. That it may please you to hasten the fulfillment of your purpose, that your church may be one. That it may please you to grant that we, with all your saints, may be partakers of your everlasting kingdom. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Hear us, O Lord, when we cry out to you. O Lord, arise and help us. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, hear our prayer. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who by your Son Jesus Christ gave many excellent gifts to your holy apostles and charged them to feed your flock, give your grace to all bishops, the pastors of your church, that they may diligently preach your word and duly administer your sacraments and wisely provide godly discipline. And grant to your people that they may obediently follow them so that all may receive the crown of everlasting glory through the merits of our Savior Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. May be seated for the reading of the word. Our first reading is taken from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 1 to 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall execute justice and, and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Psalm 100. Oh, be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Be assured that the Lord is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of our ground. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures from generation to generation. Glory be to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, beginning in the first verse. So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. This is the word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had to, to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, Follow me. The Gospel of the Lord.
Our Heavenly Father, we ask now that you would feed us as your flock with the most pure word of God. And we pray that through this, your grace would flow through us, to us, in us, over us, so that all we do would please you. And we ask these things for the sake of the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> well, everyone who is involved in the uh, realigning of the Anglican Church will have a deep interest in what is going on today here. And I want to add my thanks to Bishop Stevens, to all those who've traveled so far to come and be with us, uh, those from the United States, even those of us from Australia. And we've had a godly and prayerful election with two godly candidates, but I just wanna pause and say, in case you're interested, I have all the dirt on Dan Gifford, <laughs> and I'm happy to sell it to the highest bidder, <laughs> which I think will be Catherine, yeah. <laughs> I want us to turn our hearts for a moment to this wonderful and searching passage, 1 Peter 5, if you want to track with me on page 9, where the Apostle speaks directly to all Christian leaders who share the task of shepherding. Sunday school teachers, catechism leaders, music leaders, but particularly pastors, presbyters, priests, bishops, they're used interchangeably here at this stage. He's writing to small churches spread across the Roman Empire who are beginning to experience the hard edge of suffering for, be for being Christian. And the persecution is not yet official, it's more like losing your employment if you're a Christian or being slandered or being excluded and ridiculed because the Christian faith was viewed by its pagan neighbours as weird and vaguely immoral, a bit like today. And he addresses various groups within the congregation with special encouragement, and here in chapter 5, 1 to 7, he turns to the leaders of the Christian community who are under particular pressure, and he gets right to it in verse 2. If you look down with me, he says... Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Such a wonderful and familiar picture. God is our shepherd. He loves each of his sheep and he loves the under shepherds of his flock. And he's given us the good shepherd to be our chief shepherd. But you know that the shepherding picture is a two edged sword. On the one side, it's not at all flattering to us. Sheep are stupid. They always get the wrong end of the stick. They always make the wrong decision. And without ongoing care, compassion and discipline, they're lost. On the other side, you get the sense of privilege of being part of this group, as Peter calls us, the flock of God that is among you. The flock of God bought with the price of his own blood. He's utterly committed to this one flock. He will not lose one of us. And since it is the flock of God, it doesn't belong to any one of us or to us as a group. It is among you. In other words, God has one flock which he apportions out to various under shepherds around the world. God has appointed his sheep to various particular human shepherds. It's the other way the other way around that we usually think about this. We think we appoint clergy and bishops, and we do. But Peter turns this on its head and says God appoints people to pastors, which is why it's impossible to appoint yourself as a pastor or a bishop. And it means we also shepherd in his name for what he wants according to the way he works. So, Dan, we are appointed by God as your flock. Shepherd the flock of God that is your portion, exercising the role of oversight, bishop. This has to be one of the most clear, deep, and practical descriptions of what that looks like. And I just want to make three points. Peter makes three key points here. He tells us about the source of shepherding. He tells us about the shape of shepherding. And then he gives us a little sample of shepherding. So firstly... The source of shepherding, verses 5 
to 7. Of course, the source of all serving and all ministry and all shepherding is the grace of God. Look at verse 5 with me, please. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humility is not a feeling or a personality trait. It's not thinking less of us than we are. It's shown in active serving and it only arises from, arises from one place. It arises from an encounter with the true, gate, true grace of the living God. And the reason God resists the proud is not because he is threatened or insecure, but because until we humble ourselves, we can't receive the grace we so desperately need, and he knows that. It's only when we stop playing God and get off our high horses and step down that we can receive the grace and goodness and forgiveness of God. Grace. Grace is the source of shepherding. Grace, God's way of loving us. And it's unique. It's always free, undeserved. God has no obligation to extend grace to us. And it's always rich and overflowing and lavishing. So all our serving and all our shepherding is not some no, noble initiative on our part, but it's a glad and humble response to the grace and love he has shown us in serving us. There's lots of implications here. It means that God doesn't need our serving. It's a gift that he gives to us. He gives grace to the humble. And the gifts that we have and the opportunities that we have, they're all privileges from his hand. And if you take Peter's letter and read it through, and I suggest you do, it's a fast read. It's shot through with the grace of God. Ten times he mentions the grace of God. And he finishes this section in chapter 3, verse 10, by calling God the God of all grace. So this is the source of shepherding. We can never make too much of God's grace. It's by grace he saved us. It's by grace he gives us ministry. It's by grace he grows us. It's by grace he helps us resist Satan. It's by grace he makes us faithful and fruitful. It is the key shepherding. And if we ask Peter, what does that mean personally? His answer is verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. The mighty hand of God is the hand of God with which God delivered his people out of, ex out of um, Egypt in the Old Testament, the book of Exodus. It's always used for deliverance, always used for redeeming and saving his people. It's a kind of shorthand for his power used in kindness and grace for our deliverance. This is very important. Because in the midst of our burdens and in the midst of unjust suffering, when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, the mighty hand of God makes us realize that the sufferings and difficulties that we have are inside God's power and control and that he is working them for his purposes, deliverance, not just for us, but for the flock as well. In other words, the way that I humble myself is by casting my anxieties on God. That's the way I do it. It's not by trying to feel smaller or working up that inner grovel. It's by recognising that even in the midst of great burdens and difficulties, God is working out his purposes for me and his sheep. And it's casting the weight of those things on him instead of holding on to it. My natural way with anxiety is to hold on to it, to carry it myself, either so that others will see I'm very strong or perhaps they might take pity on me. And I grumble about the difficulties to others and I grumble about them to God until I become the centre of my prayers. It's only when we believe in the grace of God, that God's great purposes are at work, can I cast my anxieties on him and leave them with him. This is the source of shepherding, Dan. Secondly, what is the shape of, she of shepherding? That's not easy to say. The shape of shepherding. Verses uh, 2 to 3, Peter goes to our, not 
not to our outward behavior, but to our heart and motivations. And he gives three pictures of what grace, what God's grace looks like in shepherding. Three contrasts, starting with a negative, three specific spiritual characteristics. Firstly, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, for the right reason. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly, with the right motive. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock in the right manner. In other words, not grumpily, greedily, or grandiosely. And each of these flows from the grace of God to us, and each of them represents a key temptation in ministry. Think about the first one, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. This is the temptation to despise the sheep that God has given to you, to lose touch with the grace of God, and to imagine that you can keep going regardless. This is the pastor or shepherd whose heart is no longer in it, who's just going through the motions, different on the outside from the inside. And you can tell in your own life there's an unreality that creeps into your pastoral work. It's doing things because you have to do them, not because you want to, whether through burnout or fatigue or just losing touch with the joy of serving Christ. And when we lose touch with the grace of God for ourselves, we come to despise the sheep and ministry becomes a misery. I know a minister in another country who's three years away from retirement and he's lost heart for ministry, but he needs the money. So he's going through the motions and week by week by week he goes deeper down the hole. And I think this is a temptation for all believers, not just for those who are paid to go to church and particularly for bishops. So many meetings, a weariness to the flesh. You'll be dealing with pastors and priests who have lost motivation and lost direction and fallen into bad ways. Serve the Lord with willingness And that willingness comes from God as God would have you by returning daily to his grace. That's the first shape, willingly. Secondly, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. This is a temptation to use the sheep. I was going to say fleece the sheep. (laughs) But there's no reference to money in the original. Um, If you want to make a lot of money, the Anglican ministry is probably not the right place. Nor is this an excuse for churches to keep clergy poor. Shameful gain means using the sheep for any kind of personal gain for yourself. Popularity, esteem, respect, having people like you, you know, having a deficit of approval until the sheep can fill it. And when we're on that track, uh, we become a magnet for manipulation. Because when you say something people don't like, their approval will disappear overnight. It's very difficult in our culture to cross that pain line and say no to people. You're going to have to do that, to say no to people. And I think there's a particular loneliness in being a bishop where people treat you differently. mustn't get used to it. If you get used to it and depend, depend on that more than God's grace, what are you going to do when you become a disappointment? <laughs> And the antidote to this, from Peter's point of view, is eagerness, which comes from the sense of God's grace to us in Jesus Christ. You know, the older, I, the older all of us get, the wiser we get, but we lose our eagerness. We lose our zeal and our risk-taking. But if you go through Peter's letter, he's writing near the end of his life, his sense of wonder and passion and intensity of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ is hot, hot, hot. Listen to chapter 1, just one illustration. He says, Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you don't see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Pray for zeal and eagerness in your shepherds and for the humility to continue to grow in wonder and grace. And the third shape of ministry Peter mentions is not domineering over those in your charge, but being an example to the flock. I think here the temptation is to see the sheep as a barrier 
to your ministry. (laughs) And it's pride dressed up as insecurity. It comes from not casting your anxieties on God. Domineering is simply playing God. It's using your power for yourself. And you see this in young clergy who come into flock with their plans and ideas and they begin to see the sheep as the problem and an impediment to their grand plans. You know, what do you do when things don't go your way or when a pastor refuses to, get to delegate and hoards power or when a shepherd teaches their own thoughts instead of the word of God? You'll find yourself opposing God. And the antidote is being an example to the flock, leading others as Christ leads you with a soft heart, with a repenting heart, constantly growing and learning. That is the source of shepherding and the shape of shepherding. And finally, very briefly, Peter gives us a sample. It's just a brief sample of how God's grace gives shape to his ministry. And I'm going to look with you at verse 1. Remember now, this is Peter. Remember Peter in the Gospels? The whole thought of suffering and the cross was absolute nonsense. And he had it out with Peter in front of the 12. Right after Jesus had, Jesus had spoken about suffering as the way to glory and the fact that he would go to the cross. And even after the rebuke from Jesus, Peter thought that the sword was still more effective than suffering for the gospel. And his failure and denial of Jesus on the night of the trial was personally devastating to Peter. And I think you hear echoes of that beautiful breakfast on the beach in John 21 that we read part of throughout this passage, where by his grace, Jesus takes the initiative to restore Peter, not just to fellowship, but to shepherding. Did you see that? Three times Peter asks, Jesus asks, do you love me more than these? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times Peter says, I love you. And three times Jesus says, shepherd my flock, feed my lambs, shepherd my flock. Because in Jesus' mind, what really matters for ministry is not great giftedness or a big personality. It's not popularity or a big following. It's love for Jesus. Otherwise, we serve Jesus for something other than Jesus. And it's obvious that Peter has reflected hard on this failure and reflected even more deeply on God's grace to him on the beach. And it has changed him and shaped him so that in verse 1, we get this transparent demonstration of the transforming power of God's grace. Before Peter gives any command to us as shepherds, He humbles himself and he identifies with these pastors in the small churches. Verse 1, I exhort the elders among you, the priests, the presbyters among you, as a fellow elder, and it should read a fellow witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a fellow partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Uh, Peter is not afraid to call himself apostle. He does so earlier in this letter and he does so in the next letter. But here he steps down, puts himself on the same level with all the Christian pastors and leaders around the empire and with us. He says, I'm a fellow elder just like you. I have to follow this. We have the same chief shepherd. And the way the sentence reads, Peter includes us as witnesses of the sufferings of Christ and as sharers in the glory of Christ a fellow witness of the sufferings of Christ. What a painful phrase for Peter to write. He can only refer to it by God's grace. We're here to consecrate Dan as bishop. The word for witness in the Greek is martyr. It's not something we want for you, Dan. It simply means at this stage, openly testifying to the truth of Jesus Christ. It means preaching and proclaiming the facts and the significance of the the death and resurrection of Jesus. Because Christian serving begins at the foot of the cross. The church is not some strange organisation where the leaders are also expected to serve. We are the flock of God made up of servants and some are given the privilege of leading. 
It's not that church leaders lead in a particularly humble way. It's that all Christians are servants of God and some are chosen to lead. But the first step in all Christian serving is allowing Jesus to serve me first as the true shepherd. And then he says, we're also fellow partakers in the glory, not in the future, But here in the present, he says, that Christ Jesus is somehow sharing his glory with us now in part. Isn't that amazing? It's true that you'll never get your full reward in this life. The Christian ministry in Peter's view is not putting up with the suffering now and waiting dismally for the glory to come. But right now, when we're insulted for the name of Jesus Christ, God's glory and grace rests upon us now. And as the church of Jesus Christ, we're always learning what it is to face opposition and rejoicing in the pattern that Jesus has set for us. I was thinking today, Dan, we've worked together, I think, 23, maybe 24 years, probably feels like 124 for you. It's proof positive of God's grace and humility, and it's been one of life's great gifts to me. And I testify, as many others do, and we have already in this service, that your shepherding is based on the true grace of God. And as you take up this new role, we will pray that you continually draw back to the grace of God, particularly in the suffering and glory of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and that he will give you the humility that you need to walk willingly, eagerly, as, as, as an example to the flock. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Us made the Holy Spirit, made of Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. The third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again, glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated. I want to invite the co-consecrator bishops to come up. Brother Dan. The Holy Scriptures and the ancient canons command that we should not be hasty in laying on hands and admitting any person to to authority in the Church of Christ, which our Lord purchased with no less price than the shedding of his own blood. So before we admit you to this office, we will examine you in order that this congregation may know how you will conduct yourself in the Church of God. Dan, are you persuaded that you are truly called to this ministry 
according to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ and the order of this church. I am so persuaded. Then do you believe that the Holy Scriptures contain all things necessary for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? And are you determined out of the Holy Scriptures to instruct the people committed to your charge? and to teach or maintain nothing as necessary to eternal salvation, but that which may be concluded and proved by the Scriptures. I do so believe, and I am so determined, the Lord being my helper. Will you then faithfully study the Holy Scriptures and call upon God by, by prayer for the true understanding of them, so that you may be able by them to teach and exhort with wholesome doctrine and to withstand and convince those who contradict it. I will, the Lord being my helper. And are you ready, with all faithful diligence, to banish and drive away from the church all erroneous and strange doctrine, contrary to God's word, and both privately and publicly, to call upon others and encourage them to do the same? I am ready, the Lord being my helper. Will you renounce all ungodliness and worldly lusts and live a godly, righteous, and sober life in this present world, that you may show yourself in all things an example of good works for others, that the adversary may be ashamed, <clears throat> having nothing to say against you? I will, the Lord being my helper. Will you maintain and set forward as much as shall lie in you quietness, love, and peace among all people, and diligently exercise such a discipline as is by the authority of God's word and the order of his church committed to you? I will, the Lord being my helper. Will you be faithful in examining, confirming, ordaining, and sending the people of God? I will, the Lord being my helper. And will you show yourself gentle and be merciful for the sake of Christ to, to poor and needy people and to all strangers destitute of help? I will, the Lord being my helper. Now I'd like to invite the congregation, those who are able to kneel, and let us silently pray for Dan that he would be able to keep these promises and vows. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has given you a good will to do all these things, grant you also the strength and power to perform them, accomplishing in you the good work which he has begun, that you may be found perfect and without reproach on the last day, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now I invite you to kneel and invite the bishops to come forward as we sing together.
Please stand. Lord, hear our prayer. And let our cry come to you. Let us pray. Almighty God and most merciful Father, in your infinite love and goodness, you have given your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and the author of everlasting life. After he had made perfect our redemption by his death and resurrection and ascended into heaven, he sent into the whole world his apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. By the Holy Spirit, through their labor and ministry, he gathered together a great flock to set forth the eternal praise of your holy name. Grant to Dan, your servant, such grace that he may ever be ready to spread abroad your gospel, the glad tidings of reconciliation with you, and to use the authority given to him, not for destruction, but for salvation, not to hurt, but to help, so that as a wise and faithful steward, he may give to your, your family their portion in due season, and at the last may be received into everlasting joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Bless you. Receive the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a bishop in the Church of God, now committed to you by the imposition of our hands. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most merciful Father, send down upon this your servant your heavenly blessing. So endue him with your Holy Spirit that in preaching your word, he may not only be earnest to reprove, beseech, and rebuke with all love and godly discipline, but may also present a wholesome example in word and conduct, in love and faith, in chastity and purity, that having faithfully run his course at the last day, he may receive the crown of righteousness laid up by the Lord Jesus, our righteous judge, who lives and reigns with you in the same Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. We stand. Our new bishop may now be vested according to the order of bishops. So we need a chat. Let's see, what do we got here? Rachet Shamir. The Shamir? And your stole. Let's <laughs> Remember that you are always under the word of God. Give heed to reading, exhortation, and doctrine. Think upon the things contained in this book. Be diligent in them, that your growth in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ may be evident to all. In doing so, you shall save both yourself and those who hear you. Be to the flock of Christ a shepherd, not a wolf. Feed them. Do not devour them. Hold up the weak, heal the sick, bind up the brokenhearted, bring back the lapsed, and seek the lost. Do not confuse mercy with indifference. So minister discipline that you forget not mercy. And when the chief shepherd appears, you may receive the never-fading crown of glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Receive this anointing oil 
And remember continually to stir up the grace of God, which is given to you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Dan, receive this cross. And remember that he whom you serve has re reconciled us to God by his own blood. And take this ring, be faithful to the bride of Christ. Bishop, receive this mitre and remember that the authority rests in God's word and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to now invite Catherine to come up and the bishop's wives to come and pray for her since she is now a bishop's wife. So Catherine, if you'd come up. And those bishop's wives who are present, if you'd come up and pray for her. It will be a quiet prayer. And I invite those who are gathered as well to quietly pray for her. Here, I invite you guys to come up here. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm pleased to present you the newest bishop in the Church of God and his family. Say something. Bishop Dan, would you like to say anything? <laughs> Sing? Say, say anything. Oh, I it's, okay. it's that southern accent, I guess. Oh, okay. is, is there anything you'd like to say? <laughs> well, they wouldn't like it if I sang, but if I, uh, I just want to say um, thank you to God for his grace uh, that David was talking about in this sermon, um, that this service feels like God is giving his grace. I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful for my family who are here who are a wonderful grace to me, and we are in this uh, adventure together. Uh, very grateful for this treasure that God has given. Uh, I also thank the uh, Good Shepherd Church. What a wonderful family uh, who has this amazing gift of hospitality. Thank you for what you have done in uh, allowing us as a diocese to be here. What a blessing. And, um, and I am just so very thankful also for David preaching for the word of God so faithfully, for working with him for 24 years. And um, it has been a great blessing all the way through. So thank you for your love of God's word and of Jesus, the one who wrote it. Very good. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us safely greet one another in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Congratulations and God bless you. I'm
Where's the bishop? Oh, there we go. Bishop Charlie? Wait, wait. Ascribe unto the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts with praise. Tory him, offer Tory him.
the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through the great shepherd of your flock, Jesus Christ our Lord, who after his resurrection sent forth his apostles to preach the gospel and to teach all nations, and promised to be with them always, even to the end of the ages. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord who always delights in showing mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. All praise and glory is yours, O God, our Heavenly Father, for in your tender mercy you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. He made thereby his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. And he instituted in his holy gospel, commanded us to continue, a perpetual memory of his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. So now, O merciful Father, in your great goodness, we ask you to bless and sanctify with your word and Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. For in the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Amen.
Well, why don't we all stand and we'll sing this next one, May the Mind of Christ. Um, I think we have time for it, and then we'll keep going. As we stand, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And together we pray, Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us through this sacrament of your favor and goodness towards us that we are members of his mystical body of your Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of your everlasting kingdom. And we humbly ask you, Heavenly Father, to assist us with your grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all the good works that you have prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom to you the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory, now and forever. Go before us, O Lord, in all our doings with your most gracious favor and further us with your continual help that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name and finally by your mercy obtain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this day and forth forevermore. And the blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.
rejoicing in the power of the Holy Ghost. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.